What's the winning formula for the Belmont Stakes? Stay watching to find out. Today's video is brought to you by Assiniboine Downs Gaming and Event Center. And be sure to tune in to Trust the Profits Live Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern for Monday Night Lights, hosted by Matthew DeSantis. Salutations and welcome, friends. I'm your host of this episode of Trust the Profits. My name is Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at the handle at failed to menace. Well, thank you so much for tuning into this very special Belmont Stakes video where we're going to talk about the winning formula for the Belmont Stakes. Historically speaking, we're going to try to look at some of the historical data and we're going to try to look at that trend line and look at is there a winning formula for this year's 2023 Belmont Stakes? And I think you're going to be pretty interested in some of the things that I've dug up in the numbers. Now, before we get into it, make sure to press that subscribe button here on YouTube. You get all of our great content at Trust the Profits. If you're not familiar with us, we have a ton of horse racing, news, handicapping, live betting, graded stakes previews, guests from across the industry come on our shows all the time. So make sure to press that subscribe button, like this video, and also in the comments below, let us know who is your pick for the 2023 Belmont Stakes. A lot of difference of opinion. I've been reading all your comments on the various spotlight videos we've had on the different horses. And I got to be honest with you, a lot of people really like Hit Show a lot. Some people like Archangelo. Some people are really out on Tapatrice. Some people are all the way in on Tapatrice. Some people love Angel of Empire. Some people hate Angel of Empire. Some people love Forte. Some people hate Forte. Lots of differences of opinion here. That's what makes it such a fun race. But the Belmont is such an unusual race mile and a half. They're never going to run this long again. I always make that point. These horses are never going to run 12 furlongs ever again in their life. And they've never run anywhere close to this before. The longest they've run is in some cases, the Kentucky Derby at a mile and a quarter. All right. Now they're stepping up even those, and those just those horses that ran in the Kentucky Derby. Some of these horses have not yet even run a mile and a quarter yet and are going from a mile and an eighth to stretching out to a mile and a half. So this is a test of champions. Belmont is a massive, massive track. If you've never had the opportunity to go, please do. Uh, and one of the things that I was struck by, and I just went on like a random Thursday and it wasn't even a big racing weekend or anything like that. I was just struck by how cavernous the plate, when you're in there, you're just like, my Lord, you could fit a whole other track inside of this track. It feels like at times. Uh, so it is huge, and you understand those wide sweeping turns and how horses can get pretty tired and how jockeys can also, you know, if you're used to moving a turn horse at a certain point on the turn, that's got to change because it's just a different equation and a different calculation at the Belmont. But one of the things I did was I went through and looked at every single Belmont stakes since 2001, and I looked for different trends taking into consideration what we're going to see this year. Now, one of the things that's important to understand is this year we have a pay, we have a race that may not feature much of a pace. National Treasure is your light who's won the Preakness Stakes is your likely leader going into the first turn and is probably going to try to do exactly what he did in the Preakness, which is get to the lead and then slow things down up front. And so I was interested in Two factors in particular. One, how many gate to wire winners have we had since 2001? What did those races look like? What type of horses were those? And then also looking at closers. You know, we have a horse like Red Route One, who's a deep closer. We have horses like Forte, who have come from very far off the pace in the Florida Derby, or Tapa Trice, who's come from very far off the pace in the Tampa Bay Derby. And some of that was just because of stumbling out of the gate, et cetera. But you've had horses come from very far back. Even Angel of Empire has had races where he's a little bit further back than normal. So I was interested in going, how many races have you seen horses come from pretty far back at, I kind of made an arbitrary decision, interested in around the half mile mark. And so that's what I was really interested in. And that's what we're going to dive into a little bit here. So over the last year, since uh, 2001, and by the way, I should mention, I did not use 2020 in any of this data analysis because 2020 was, of course, the year that tis now, uh, or tis the law, I should say, won. Tis the law. That was a unique year because of COVID. The Triple Crown was run out of sequence. The Belmont was run at a mile and an eighth rather than a mile and a half. So for all of those reasons, uh, I just eliminated 2020 as a data point in all of this analysis. So from 20, 2001 to now without 2020. 
We've had three gate to wire winners, Deterra in 2008, and then the two triple crown winners, American Pharaoh in 2015 and Justify in 2018. Well, that should tell you something that gate to wire winners are kind of rare at the Belmont. And the horses that have done it, Deterra, very, very good horse. Two of the three were triple crown winning horses and Bob Baffert horses. Now, you might say National Treasures of Bob Baffert horse. He already won one leg of the triple crown in the Preakness. He was not eligible to run in the Kentucky Derby for a variety of reasons. Uh, most notably, he didn't earn enough points to get into it. That being said, I would not put National Treasure in the class of Justified American Pharaoh and probably not even to Terra, to be honest. So it does make you wonder, does National Treasure really have the stuff to take them gate to wire? Not a lot of horses do. Some horses have tried. They've held on to the very end, but it's really hard to go gate to wire at the Belmont. You ultimately generally want to find horses that stalk, that sit two, three, maybe four lengths at most off of the pace. Therefore, I was interested in looking at horses that were five or more lengths off the pace at the half mile mark. From Since 2001, only five horses have fit that description that had been five plus lengths back at the half mile mark. That was a Fleet Alex in 2005, Jazzle in 2016, or 2006, Creator in 2016, Sir Winston in 2019, and then, of course, Essential Quality in 2021. So again, closers are also a little bit rare. That's one of those myths that's out there at the Belmont that somehow closers do better at the Belmont. Not necessarily. It's about pace, not about distance a lot of times. Just because you close doesn't mean you like more distance. It means you like a stronger pace in front of you. Now, there are some horses that are both of those things, but a lot of times, you know, a horse like Red Route 1, I would argue, is pace dependent. He's not distance dependent. He's He needs a fast pace to run into, whether he's doing it at seven furlongs or a mile and a half. A horse like Tappet Trice, on the other hand, might be a little bit more of a distance type of a horse that just does naturally get stronger the longer he goes and he can run into any type of a pace because of how well he runs late. So again, different types of horses, but this idea that somehow Belmont's for horses that are closers because, oh, they just need a little bit more ground. They just want a little bit more. Not always the case. The other thing that was interesting that I that caught my eye when looking at this is since uh, 2001, only seven times in the 21 races that I looked at, did you have multiple lead changes at the various calls? In other words, at the quarter, at the half, the mile, and at the mile and a quarter point. Most times, 14 of the 21 times, you had a horse either in the three instances above, take him gate to wire, or you had a horse leading to a point, and then the eventual winner would take over. Okay? Seven times what you had was somebody's leading, then somebody else takes over, and then yet somebody else wins, all right? So you have kind of multiple lead changes in that regard. So that only happens seven out of the 21 times. So what's more common is for one horse to lead and then for the horse that's going to make the push to win, makes the push to win and gets the job done. So that was also kind of an interesting dynamic because I do think we've talked about National Treasure being up front. Is he going to face waves of challenges? Is he going to face a wave of from those horses sitting closer initially, like Archangelo, like Hit Show, maybe like, you know, probably not Il Maricolo, but, you know, are there a couple of horses that are going to be sitting closer that might push him first? And then you get the second wave of Angel of Empire, Forte, and Tapa Trice. We'll see. But I think, like I said, that was kind of an interesting examination. So the next thing I did was I wanted to look at the times for the Gate to Wire winners. And so this was that's something that was a little bit interesting, just looking at the quarter, half, three quarter mile, mile on a quarter and then the final times for Deterra, American Pharaoh, and Justify. And what you can see here is that it's interesting where there are similarities between these two. Uh, that, that Pharaoh year was really interesting because, you know, you look at the half mile time, 48 and one for Deterra, 48 and four for Pharaoh, 48 flat for Justify. Pharaoh was going a little slower early, but you'll notice Pharaoh by far and away had the best time late. Uh, by, you know, oh, well over a second, almost a second and a half faster than anything that the rest of them did. And so might have gone a little slow early, but just got stronger as the race went on. It felt like and just was very, you know, uh, very methodical about his running lines there. The interesting point is looking at that three quarters time uh, because those were pretty similar. One twelve and four, one thirteen and two, one thirteen and one, all 
you know, very close together there. Uh, and then obviously you see the one mile time being almost all identical, 137 and four, 137 and four, 138 flat. So they're running that first mile at almost the exact same speed. And then that's when you start to see some deviation go on is, you know, then the pace kind of really slows down a little bit in the year for Tatera and gets that really slow final time of 129 and three, whereas the pace kind of continues and Farrow is able to kind of just keep that train rolling along to have the one, uh, the 226 and three uh, for the final time in that one. So interesting to see there wasn't necessarily a trend, only three cases. So hard to really make too much out of is there a discernible trend in terms of gate to wire fashion? The one thing I will say is that these are much stronger paces than what I would imagine National Treasure is going to try to set. National Treasure, just to give you some perspective, and I'll bring this up again at the end, ran a 49 and three or 49 and four. I'm sorry, excuse me, 49 and four opening half mile at the Preakness, going a mile and three sixteenths. So he wasn't running anywhere near these fractions at the half mile point and really even going further into the three quarters of a mile point at a shorter distance. So hard to see him running this type of uh, these types of fractions early on. That's what I mean. Maybe not the same caliber of horse that we see from Deterra, American Pharaoh and Justify. But here's the really interesting one is I wanted to take a look closer look at the fractions that were being run into from the five deep closers, the horses that came from five or more lengths from off the pace. And this was something that I thought was very interesting was you see a fleet, Alex, Jazzle creator, Sir Winston, a central quality, a lot of variation, you know, a lot of variation in terms of that opening quarter, certainly, you know, from the high end of a fleet, Alex running behind a 24 and two to essential quality when hot rod, Charlie setting that very fast early pace for that opening quarter of a mile, 22 and three, the fastest opening quarter in the history of the Belmont when run at a mile and a half. And then you look at that half mile time again, still a fair amount of variation between again, a fleet Alex and Sir Winston at 48 and three. Meanwhile, essential quality ran into 46 and two opening half jazzle 47 and one also very strong pace opening half. You start to see a little bit more symmetry as we get to the three quarter point. 112 and 4, 112 flat the year for Jazzle, as well as the year for Central Quality, and then 113 and 1, 113 and 2. So you still see a little bit of variation there. You go on to the one mile mark. Again, you're starting to see things standardized as you go out a little bit more. But these are the sorts of paces that were necessary to be run into uh, in these uh, in, in these various races. And obviously, in the case of Essential Quality, in the case of Jazzle in particular, those two horses were obviously benefited by a rather strong pace up front that they could easily run into. But again, this does not happen often. Only five times out of the 21 races since 2001 that were run at 12 furlongs have you seen horses coming from five plus lengths back to actually win the Belmont Stakes. So it is not a common move, particularly one. And again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Those half mile times are all sub 49. Okay. That is probably not what National Treasure is going to run. Uh, National Treasure is going to try to run a 49-plus opening half mile. So, again, I don't think 48-2 and two is necessarily blistering or 48-3 and three is, is blistering. But I don't know if the horses in this year's Belmont Stakes are going to get even that pace to run into, let alone a 46-2, and 47-1 and one type of pace that you saw from Essential Quality and Jazzle. Now, here's another intriguing statistic that I did. And so I did this in two different ways. So I wanted to look at how many lengths back the eventual winning horse was at the a quarter mile, at the half mile, at the mile, and at the mile and a quarter mark. And so I wanted to look at the average number of lengths. And of course, taking into consideration the median as well, because the average can be inflated by one or two figures. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think your creator one came from like really far off. Uh, and so there's a little bit of variation. Now in the top table, I have included the gate to wire winners in that analysis. They all earned a zero. So every other horse was, you know, if they were three lengths back, they got three. If they were three and a half lengths back, 3.5, three and three quarters, 3.75. So everybody got a number of lengths back. The gate to wire winners, I just had a zero in there because they were zero lengths back. They were in the lead. 
So I ran the numbers once with the gate to wire winners included, just have everybody from all of the years that we did it. And then the bottom table, you'll see, I removed the gate to wire winners. So I was only looking at the horses that effectively closed from off the lead, even if they were just closing from a half a a half a length or a length off of the lead, even if they were sitting second or third most of the trip and being very, very close, I still included them, but I eliminated those gate to wire winners of Deterra, American Pharoah, and Justified from that second and bottom table. So what you'll see is on average, if you look at the gate to wire winners included in the top column, on average, you'll see they're sitting no more than three and three quarter lengths off at the opening quarter and three and a half lengths off at the opening mile, and they're two lengths off by the mile point. And then by the mile and a quarter, they're pretty much still right up on the pace. Obviously, the median's a little bit different, but you know you, you see it kind of standardizing a little bit more uh, for that data set. Now, when you remove the gate-to-wire winners and you're just looking at the horses that won the Belmont Stakes, the 18 of the last 21, who won from off the pace. And again, there's a lot of variation here from horses that were a half a length off the pace to 11 lengths off the pace. But when you look at just the horses that won from off the pace, again, the average distance off early was about four and a half lengths. By the half mile point, though, even when you eliminate the gate to wire winners, you are still only four lengths off the pace on average for those winning horses. At the mile point, your little little less than two and a half lengths off. And by the mile and a quarter point, again, you better be right about a length off of the pace if you want to have a chance to win on average. So what does all of this data tell us? Well, it tells us a lot of things. So first of all, it goes back to what I mentioned about National Treasure and the, the times that National Treasure ran in the Preakness. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. So going a shorter distance, National Treasure went 23 and four, 48 and four. Now, again, if we go back two slides, I want you to find me a half mile time that is greater than 48 and four that any of these closers closed into. The answer is it does not exist. Nobody has ever closed into a time that slow at the Belmont since 2001. But ultimately, that is what he ran. Opening three quarters and one thirteen and two. Again, a rather slow and pedestrian three quarters of a mile for the Preakness. Now we're stretching out. You would imagine that they're going to try to slow things down even more. And additionally, all of the other horses are going to be more cautious as well because they know that they need to try to get the 12 furlongs. They're not going to try to blister this pace too much because they're going to try to you know, make sure they can still be there at the end. And you don't have a lot of horses that naturally want to get the lead. Now, that being said, gate to wire winners are rare. So even though National Treasure may very well be able to set the pace up front that he wants, it still is not something that happens very often. And the fact that two of the three who've done it in the last 20 plus years have both been triple crown winners makes you think that it's probably unlikely that National Treasure is going to be able to take them gate to wire here. Now, a horse to talk about for a second. Il Maricolo. Il Maricolo may hold the key to this entire race. This is a horse that has only won twice in 10 career starts, but the two wins that he's had have been gate to wire efforts. One time in a maiden and one time, which was last time out, which was a one turn mile in an allowance race at Gulfstream Park. Now, the reason that Il Maricolo is a wild card is because every other race this horse has run in, all of the other eight races, this horse hasn't been anywhere near the lead. So, I don't know what the intent is. If you tell me Il Maricolo is going to gun it and going to try to pressure National Treasure, then suddenly those paces might quicken and it might allow for horses coming from further back to suddenly have a shot, all right? But if you tell me Il Maricolo is going to run the way he did at the Florida Derby, at the Holy Bull, at the Fountain of Youth, well, then I'm going to tell you National Treasure is going to be able to set his pace the way he wants up front. That's why I don't have a ton of confidence in Il Maricolo. I know some people say, oh no, he's going to gun the, he's going to go to the lead, he's going to gun it. Okay, I mean, that should have been the plan like for the last five times he ran and he didn't do it. So I just don't know if in this level he's going to be able to do that because that's one of the things he's not demonstrated the ability to do at a two-turn race is, and, and at this level of a graded stakes two-turn race, is to get up on the lead. So I have my doubts about Il Maricolo, but he's the wild card. He is the absolute wild card in this race. Now, the winning formula. If I'm looking at this historic data, if I'm looking at the way this race is probably going to be run, 
I don't want horses sitting any more than about four lengths off the lead, to be perfectly honest with you. And this then poses a lot of questions. How close is Tapa Trice going to be? Now, I think there's a lot of variation in people's opinions on this. And then the same thing is true with Forte. What I would just tell you is no matter how you want to handicap this race, no matter how you see the pace playing out, what I'm telling you is you want a horse that's no more than four or five lengths, at most five lengths. I would even argue, looking at the historical data, you really want a horse that's like three to four lengths off the lead at the Belmont, for the most part, at the half mile mark, okay? So you want a horse that's relatively close up and is more of a stalking type of a horse. You don't want a horse that's more than five lengths off. And if you think Tapa Trice is going to be five or more lengths off, I'll be honest, he's kind of a toss. And if you think Forte is going to be five or more lengths off, he's also a little bit of a toss then. Now, if you think they both are going to be up a little bit closer than they have been in the past, if you think Fort, if you think Tapa Trice in particular might try to sit the same trip he did at the Bluegrass, where he kind of hustled up after a slow start and got up easily within about four lengths of the lead, then that makes a lot more sense to use Tapa Trice in that spot. But to, no matter how you see that playing out, three to four lengths, I would argue, is really the key to being there in this list distance. I think that really opens things up potentially for long shots like Hit Show or Archangelo. I think that means they are going to sit maybe a little bit more of an ideal trip. They're not going to be that far back, I don't think. They're going to be three, four lengths, maybe even two or three lengths off the lead. And again, historically, that's where you want to be, is very close to the lead, but not on the lead at the Belmont Stakes. It's a very, listen, it's a, it's a needle to thread for sure. But it's one that has been very beneficial at the Belmont Stakes in the past. So I hope you appreciated this little bit of a data dive into the history of the Belmont since 2001, taking a look at some of those fractional times, taking a look at what's been a successful move and what hasn't. Obviously, there's all sorts of other factors. I mean, only two of those years, I should mention, did we have sloppy tracks, okay? Uh, most of the years, 19 of the 21 years I looked at, dry, fast tracks. The weather in New York this week, beautiful expect another dry fast track for saturday so track conditions didn't really play too much of a factor like i said expect for national i mean if, if i'm going off the data and i'm going off what history tells me what history tells me is national treasure is going to be in the lead until he's not and the horse that passes him first it's going to be the horse that ends up winning this race so i think a horse maybe like an angel of empire like an archangelo like a hit show they they make a lot more sense, I think, now looking at that historical data a little bit more. Well, like I said, friends, I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure to let me know your thoughts on this video below. Let me know who you like in the Belmont Stakes this year. Make sure to press that subscribe button here on YouTube for all of our content on Trust the Profits as well. Until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis, wishing you a great and profitable day at the races and reminding you that it's now post time.